Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another musical moment in the life of the old-time rock and roller. Today, we will be focusing a few minutes on a story from the golden age of rock and roll. Greetings. Welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us. Forrest Howie McDonald is an American singer, songwriter, and instrumentalist whose main body of work has been in the blues and blues rock genre. During the mid to late 60s, Forrest played in a number of bands, which included a stint with Wadsworth Mansion beginning in 1972. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Mr. McDonald played and recorded with various musicians, including playing the guitar solo on Bob Seger's Old Time Rock and Roll. After a move to Atlanta in 1991, Forrest started his own record label, broke out on his own, and formed his own band. To date, he has some 15 releases. Many accolades have been bestowed on Forrest and his music over the years. He has written some 200 songs, has headlined and played tons of festivals, and has a worldwide fan base. His latest, Blues in a Bucket, was nominated for a Grammy. Well, welcome, Forrest. Hey, Gary. Great to be here. All right. Thanks. Oh, there we go. <laughs> he's gonna, he, I knew he's going to get the, the cameo appearance in there, mm -hmm. uh, voice, or, voice or visual. Well, take us back to the to the beginning. So you were born in Austin. That's absolutely correct. 1950. So, okay. oh. Although my family was centered around Orange, Texas at the time. And uh, Johnny Winter's drummer, Homer, Homer Turner, went to high school with my cousin, C. So oh. we were close. And Gatemouth Brown was also from Orange. And he was really good friends with my uncle Jim. Wow, that's something else there too. So you had that had the influence early on there too. Yeah, that's that's true. And I'll just throw this in; it has nothing to do with it. But that's my right. my my oldest uncle, Uncle John, was pumping gas at a filling station, and Bonnie and Clyde pulled in, and tanked up. Of oh. course, they didn't pay for the gas. Uh, and then they went off towards Crowley and wherever it was. And it, seven or eight hours later, they had to shoot out and no more Bonnie and Clyde. So my uncle John was one of the last to see them alive. Wow. You know, I used to work with a guy and uh, he showed us a picture and he, it was of Clyde. And um, he, he we didn't believe him at first, you know, we thought, oh yeah, you're just making all this up, you know, but then I saw the picture again years later online, and I wow. said, wow, he actually had a copy of that, you know, so very, really? very, very interesting. Well, um, talk about some uh, other uh, fond uh, childhood memories that, that you may have. Um, well, okay, um, so when my dad was a college professor and a historian, and became a famous constitutional scholar. His first teaching job was at the University of Wisconsin. And when I was seven years old, he took the family on a Sunday afternoon, about two o'clock and Josh White Jr. was Ooh. giving a solo concert. We were all on the blanket on the hill and there's Josh playing. And there was just something about it that just, made me feel just warm and safe and uh, just it, it was a hard to describe moment but the blues jumped in me and my dad had a josh at midnight and uh josh white sings spirituals and blues so i learned several songs off that album and recorded uh one of one of the songs off that album on my what's it gonna take cd a song called southern exposure well my sister kathy and i she's a year and a half older we always loved watching the benny goodman story and the glenn miller story and the gene krupa story all that was on at, at the same time and then carl perkins came out with blue suede shoes 
and my dad came back from New York from a trip and he brought us Elvis Presley Hound Dog and all shook up the 45. And this oh. was 57, 58, 59, I don't know, whenever it was, but it had to be around then because in 59, he got a job teaching at Brown University. So right after Christmas, we packed up and left the frozen tundra of Madison, Wisconsin, and journeyed up to Providence, Rhode Island. And our house was a little summer cottage on Rumstick Point, where wealthy elite would make their summer home and then split. Well, <laughs> we moved in just after Christmas, and the backyard was right on the bay and would hear the buoy going clang, clang, and would see the light from the lighthouse. You know, about every 45 seconds flash on the wall behind us. It was it was just a really eerie vibe, you know? It was kind of cool though. But I, <laughs> I started my first band uh, when I was 14. Uh, we, we went to the Episcopal Conference Center which was the Episcopal Diocese of Rhode Island. And it was basically a church camp. And boy, I did not want to go. I jumped out of the car and hid in the marsh uh, on the way there. But it turned out, I asked my mom if I could stay another week after the family camp was over. And it was just really great. I ended up becoming a counselor there and meeting all the people in my first band, except for my keyboard player, there uh, at the ECC, we called it. And we played all of the barn dances every Friday night. Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but um, the Oxbow Incidents basically was, was my first real cover group. And we played at all of the churches the church dances so we automatically had maybe 10 jobs a month uh, but uh but i'm a little ahead of myself um that's and, all right yeah the I, I had uh the seagram seven prior yes to that's where i was going uh, okay so i met these cats at at the camp and we all decided well, let's try and do something right and so brian dawson he had a set of drums and he, he their their home was a funeral home and we cleared the all this stuff out and we practiced there and our our first singer paul tiny lister he was a big guy so everyone called him tiny yeah. um he, he, he got us this job at the harrisville civic center in pasco rhode island for 40 bucks on new year's eve so we called ourselves the Seagram Seven. Uh, I auditioned people for the gig. And first guy over was a guy named Bob Wiegan, who was kind of a funny looking guy, but he was from my town and he was a really good drummer uh, for 13. Uh, so I said, well, I got one more guy to audition. The next guy came in was named Ed Riccio and Ed, and I went to high school together and he wasn't as good a drummer as Bob, but he had a driver's license and a fake ID. So yeah. that, that gave him the nudge over Bob. Uh, <laughs> right. but, but, but while we were practicing, Bob went over to the piano we had in the parlor and started playing all the songs. And I said, Holy smokes, you're my piano player. And he said, yeah, I took classical lessons for seven years. And, you know, I'm just starting to play this stuff, even though I'm a drummer. Uh, so we hired Bob. So when we got to the gig, there were seven of us. We called ourselves the Seagram Seven. During Wipeout, Ed Riccio couldn't play the beat, but Bob Wiegand could. So Ed got off the drums. Bob went over and played the, the Wipeout beat. And then we were playing Walk, Don't Run. And I I played all the lead parts. I was not so much into rhythm i just to me uh, the purpose of a song was the solo not oh. the words nothing else right. only the solo mattered uh, right 
right? So we're playing walk, don't run. And we got into the, the complex bridge. And so the rhythm guitar player, John Holsher, who was a, a cabin mate of mine from back at the camp, he flipped his amp off and, you know, just <laughs> did whatever. And then when we got back into the do 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 then he, he turned it back on for A minor G F E. Um, you know what? You know what's interesting about the uh, Walk Don't Run. You yeah. know how the first band or artist that you heard play it for forever until you find out otherwise. You think that was the original version. Mm -hmm. You know. So Herb Albert version was the first version I ever heard of that. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. So I didn't know. You know, he didn't do the original. No. You know. And so you, but in your mind, you're thinking, oh, wow, you know, because you think of the, with the, uh, the Spanish flavor to it and everything like that. Yeah. But, uh, I'm glad yeah. when I found out, you know, that it's the original of that. So, yeah, interesting, interesting. And so um, the, when, when at the end of that job, I said, okay, I need a, because we had two lead singers, Brian Dawson, who was the drummer he could also sing a little bit. So he and Tiny, Tiny both sang. And I, I cleaned house afterwards and started the group and we became the Oxbow Incidents. My sister, Kathy, furnished us the title. And our first real cool job that wasn't a church job was Sigma Nu Fraternity at Brown University. Phone rings, I pick it up. Uh, yeah, is this where the Oxbow incidents are located? I said, yeah. How would you like to play a, a frat party for 60 bucks on uh, March 21st? I said, sure. And he said, okay, you're done. But get here by, you know, seven o'clock or something. So I hung up and I was ecstatic. And then I thought, oh, this has got to be a joke. <laughs> so I, I called the fraternity back and uh, confirmed that it was real. So. Everybody was excited. We went out and got the Flag Brothers Beetle boots and <laughs> dungarees and then wore a powder blue shirt with a black knit tie and a blue blazer. That was our first <laughs> outfit. Yeah. Well, we did go to a battle of the bands. The first one, it was in uh, South Providence. It was kind of a, a rough area, but we only knew like wipe out and no matter what shape your stomach is in the alka Salser commercial and the batman theme song and you know <laughs> just, i mean it really sucked but house of the rising sun but but we did it and, and on the way up to the job uh some motorcyclists passed us uh bob's mom was driving us and they, they had the patch on the back ecmf and you could it, it, probably guess what that is but bob's mom said bobby what does ecmf stand for and it's all uh, you know the east coast mother humpers but but he said oh mom that's the east coast mo motorcycle fraternity <laughs> said, okay that's great so <laughs> so everybody played their thing and at the battle of the bands and secret agent man johnny rivers was the hit song at the time Oh, yeah. So the, the last band comes out and they were called the Untouchables. Mm -hmm. They all had the, the pointed black shoes, peg black pants, white ruffled shirts with vests on with leopard skin vests. And they all wore derbies and they came out and opened up with Secret Agent Man. And of course, we were smoked and so was everybody else, you know, like the Blues Brothers. Let's smoke these turkeys, you know. Uh, but but it was a great experience, nevertheless. And so, well, you guys, you guys, as the Oxbow incidents, you had quite the following up there in that area of the of the country. We were a big regional band for yeah. three and a half years in New England, and we yeah. had we had a heck of a lot of fun. Um, the, the band finally broke up. It, our last job was at the Orchid Room on Valentine's Day in 1969. And I was living in Boston. I saw an ad for the Boston Rock Symphony at EU Wurlitzer's, the local music store. So I, I called up and I auditioned and there were two chairs. Um, and you think, what's a chair? But 
it, it was they were advertising for an 11 piece rock band to do an around the world tour with Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops Orchestra. I got the job and a guy named Melvin Wax from Long Island, who was a Berkeley student, also was hired. James Montgomery, the blues harmonica player from Detroit, who had moved to Boston, he got on the gig as well. Um, it was, so we practiced for months. Finally, opening day, Symphony Hall it was April. I went down in the afternoon in my van and set up my 100-watt Marshall stack got a little bit of a sound, went back to my apartment, put on my tuxedo and left, but the van wouldn't start. Uh -huh. So I, I hitchhiked to Symphony Hall wearing my tuxedo, carrying my guitar. We we got there and the, the place filled up. And, you know, that buzz. And then you, you hear the orchestra getting ready and all that stuff. So the curtain opens and they start with this elegant music and everything. And now it's time for the rock band to come in. Well, yeah. all of this time, nobody thought it was necessary for us to rehearse with the symphony guys because they're pros. They just read music and that's it, you know. So we started out and these 100 watt marshals, <laughs> yeah, the violin their their two pays were jumping off the <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it was just and they you know <laughs> and they they just all stopped playing and um uh, and, and nobody knew what to do so i said blues jam in g and we started into a shuffle and i kicked off some bb king licks and uh finally the the promoter uh, realized this was a total fiasco and he <laughs> power i could hear my marshal going <laughs> out of juice as the last notes faded died and broke and the boston rock symphony went up in smoke <laughs> a lot of a lot of deaf musicians after that <laughs> yeah that's for sure um but that was my first real big time experience um then then I put an all original group together and was working on that. We ran out of money. That was the deadly mantis. So I moved down to Provincetown, Mass, P Town, we called it. Was that and, was that pale uh, was that sorry, was that pale rider that you were pale rider, about? yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, uh my when I went to college, I met a senior named Steve Blodgett. And he had studied or met Doc Watson, and he he had he could finger pick just like unbelievable. So we started hanging out and playing together and gigging and like this. And we, how was it? My girlfriend Pepper and I were in Cambridge, uh, Harvard Square in Boston, and she met a drummer that she knew, a guy named Charlie Flannery who was an underclassman of hers, but the grade above me. And she introduced us at outside Hung Ups, the bell bottom store. And we started talking about the cream and everything. And Charlie was, you know, Ginger Baker, this and that. And we said, well, let's, you know, let's start a group. He said, okay. Um, and he knew a guy named David Hayes from Dighton, Mass, whose father was, like an, a captain or something in the Navy. And David had an older brother named Gary. Well, we got Charlie, Dave, me. I got Bob Wiegand, our keyboard player. And we rented a little house in Tiverton, Mass. And we started gigging around. And our last job was at a place called The Phone Booth in Warren, Rhode Island, in the middle of a snowstorm. I mean, it was a blizzard. So one guy came in off the street to uh, get out of the snow and the waitress was there and the bartender. So I think we were playing for the door and uh, it was $2.10. Uh, so at the end of the night, the waitress came up and uh, on the serving tray and put it down and there was the 2.10. We did get free <laughs> beer. So Charlie... 
took it, what was left of his pitcher of beer and he poured it on the two dollars and ten cents and made a speech through the microphone. <laughs> it, it was it was funny. Uh, and after that, we were driving through downtown Fall River trying to get something to eat. And a snowplow came down a big street. He couldn't stop, and he hit the front of Dave's car and clipped it off. They they were lucky, and they made it back to um, the crib. Uh, nobody, but nobody. so we we laid low for a little bit, but then the summer came around, and we got a job at the Barrington Yacht Club, okay. which is where I played a lot in my high school band. So we rode up from the Cape, and we were drunk and probably stoned, and just we we opened the door at the yacht club, and we kind of fell out into the parking lot. <laughs> well, it, it turned out it was a double book. The R biggest rival in high school was when i was a sophomore the fresh uh the senior band was called the ascots and they did a lot of uh, beatles songs and whatnot and they were double booked to play with us um, but they weren't called the ascots they were called something else but vinnie and teddy medbury were cousins and they were on the job well they went into the raven where uh, Vinny Medbury, he just went, oh, I'm going to rave. And, and it was just like freaking everybody out. It, there was, you know, they wanted, I can't get no satisfaction and glory and stuff like that. So the guy who, who had booked the job was actually my old coach in junior high school, Larry Duchesne. He, he had a bald head and we called him bowling ball. But he came running out to the parking lot and he said, Howard, Howard, get your band in there. Get in there right now. We get to get these guys off the stage. Well, as it turned out, after that gig, Vinnie Medbury was driving to California. Mm -hmm. And Dave Hayes said, you know what? I want to get out of here. Can you give me a ride? And he said, okay. And they went out to California. Dave slept on Mount Tamil Pius the first three months. Elephant Mountain, if you recall, the Youngblood's first album, maybe yeah. second, but, but it, it had the mountain in the back. That was Mount Tamil Pius. And Dave got a job playing bass for Jesse Colin Young from the Youngbloods. Young Blood, yeah. And so then, so Dave had a couple of bucks and he moved into an airplane hangar. And, and you know, put a sleeping thing on the floor there. And after it, it, a while, they came and toured in Boston and played at Paul's Mall in the Jazz Workshop. Well, Charlie and I went to see him, and there was Dave with the. When, it was the day when the black satin touring jackets were in, and you know, Van Morrison, <laughs> or you know, Jesse Colin Young, whatever was written on the back. So we said, "Wow, Dave's made it." Uh, well, when when Dave left Jesse, he became Van Morrison's bass player, and right. still plays with him today. Wow. So um, yeah. I, I ran into him in L.A. That's later in the story. The other cool. guy, the, his cousin, the drummer Teddy Medbury, uh, mm -hmm. on it was a New Year's Eve, maybe nineteen seventy four. He joined a group called the Movies. And they played on the Queen Elizabeth, and um, and I'm you know watching with my girlfriend the the festivities and whatnot, and I say, oh, that's Teddy Medbury. Uh, so <laughs> you recognize him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. Well, yeah. Ted, Teddy had a glass eye, and okay. and for theatrics, he was not beyond <laughs> sometimes pulling it out and popping it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there were, there were some wild guys. Um, well, oh, you, know, you know what would have been really fun to do is do like the ma magician trick with, you know, the quarter, take oh, your yeah. eye out, and oh. then and pull, pull it pull from behind back somebody's, from somebody's ear. ear and pop it. Yeah, that would have been something. <laughs> oh, that's, well, that's well, going, going back, going back a, a few years, probably, you had uh, quite a few. Uh, memorable incidents at the Newport Music Festival. Oh, yeah, that's true. In fact, I did a great uh, 
video on it, but in 64, I, I heard Count Basie and Ray Charles and uh, uh, Bob Dylan. And in 65, yeah. I had a ticket and I saw Dylan when he yeah. first went electric. electric. And he came out in a purple suit with a Stratocaster with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band backing him up. Yeah. Uh, Mike Bloomfield, Harvey Brooks, uh, all of them. And they came out and just played some, uh, I think Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat was his first song. And it was, the PA was horrible. The mix was horrible. And people wanted, you know, it's all over now, baby blue. They started booing and booing and he went in the next song and booing. And they finally booed him off the stage. And he, he actually started crying and he left. And he, after about 15 minutes, he regained his composure and came back with his Gibson Hummingbird and did all of his acoustic stuff and the crowd loved it. But that was wow. a historic moment. You were there. Yeah. How did you feel? Did you feel a little sorry for him? or uh, how were you? Yeah, I did. Uh, because... You know, I had heard Highway 61 revisited and, uh, you know, Tom Thumbs Blues and Highway 61 and the electric stuff. So I I was used to that. So I didn't really care what it was. It was just the great Bob Dylan. I was going to see him. In it. So uh, I got to hear his electric attempt that wasn't very good. And then I got to see the the folk artist Dylan too so and then I, I also saw Sonny and Cher that afternoon by the way oh the uh, same afternoon wow. same afternoon it was pretty cool <laughs> well fast, fast forward about what four years again um, at Newport, Newport you got to uh, hobnob with uh, guitar royalty oh, Jimmy, wow. Page, Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck yes wow. yes um, the Boston Tea Party mm -hmm. was a famous club is it, it it the original tea party was on Lansdowne Street and it was an old church while that was just starting up Brown University spring weekend every what? April had um a, a big uh, rock weekend mm -hmm. and this uh particular weekend the um the yardbirds were playing so okay. My band, the Oxbow Incidents, we were all out front waiting for the bus to pull up. And they pulled up and I introduced myself to Richard Smith, I believe, the, one of the roadies right off the bat and acted as their tour guide. And so I showed him the stage and the promoter came out and he said, well, it looks like rain. I think we better move this over to me in auditorium. Um and the, the driver who was in the band said, well, where's that? And I said, we'll show you. Come on. So <laughs> the whole band got to get on the bus and we drove about a mile over to the Mian Auditorium. And we were sitting in the parking lot and getting to know the guys, you know, hey, I'm uh, Jimmy McCarty, you know, or I'm Keith Ralph. I'm Jimmy Page, you know, I'm Chris Treja. And we were just, yeah. Uh, young up and coming wannabe rock stars with real rock stars, right? Uh, well, we got to, at least I did, sit with Jimmy and uh, Keith in their dressing room. And I Magazine was a big rock magazine at the time. And there were pictures of the cream in there. And actually, cream, people just say the cream. My error, my bad. There were pictures of cream in there and Eric Clapton was soloing and he might have been in the middle of, of something heavy and he's going. <laughs> and, and, and Jimmy would say, oh, look at those faces he's making. Look at those faces. And it came time for them to get dressed and, and go on. So we went out front to catch the show. The closing number was dazed and confused, if you can believe it. And of course, it didn't send, sound anything like with Zeppelin, but right. I, I kept in touch. Um, and so when I saw the Jeff Beck group was coming to the Boston Tea Party in October, I bought a ticket. 